Welcome back to The Mining Pod. This week, we're joined again by Matt Kimmel of CoinShares to talk about this week's news. We're talking about Compute North filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, Stakefish slashing 25% of its workforce, and Bitmain lowering ASIC prices by 30%. Matt, how's it going? How are you doing today? Excellent. Excellent. We got a lot, a lot of big news. We recorded one already, but we're going to talk again and re-record this episode because huge news came out yesterday about Compute North filing Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Before we dive into a disclosure, Compass Mining, which owns the show, does work with Compute North. We have a few deployments with them. So we will address that as we need to during the show, but just a disclosure up front. This is big news because Compute North is one of the largest hosting firms within the United States, and they host for a plethora of companies, including Marathon Digital, which is probably the most well-known Bitcoin mining company out there besides maybe Riot. A lot of people have exposure to them in their 401ks if they want to buy Bitcoin miners, uh, Bitcoin mining equities. So this is this is pretty big news for the entire space. And I think it fulfills a lot of predictions that a lot of people had about someone going belly up during the bear market. Kick it over to you. We have a few other stories to talk about today. Uh, but yeah, this is definitely the biggest one to start out with. It's major. I, this is like, it's an exciting week to do a pod because there's a lot of great news to talk about. Um, but this is like... News. Kind of bad news. I mean, it's bad news, but it's just exciting that we have like well i mean we're just following the merge we had a great week last week too but this is this is the magnitude of this is big right we've been talking about a potential um miner going down for a while because of adverse market conditions but compute north is like a shark in the water they're massive um and just, we just didn't know that much about them you know their finances because they're private right um But there, so let's see, let's get into the details of this. It's a chapter 11 filing, so they may be able to continue operations. And we'll see how the court system sort of um, comes together to figure out what to do for the creditors here and what's best for them. But this doesn't necessarily mean that all operations are going to shut down abruptly and that all assets are going to be sold, right? It may be um, in the best scenario for the creditors that compute north sort of continues their operations because it's the best way for them to make money and pay everybody back. Um, that being said, compute north has a lot of assets. I got, I looked it up right before the show here. They have 300 megawatts in big Springs, Texas, another 280 megawatts in McCammy, McCammy, maybe correct me in the comments on the pronunciation there. Also in Texas, seven megawatts in South Dakota and a hundred more in Nebraska. That's, 687 megawatts, a lot of rack space, right? A lot of power agreements. So, I mean, at the end of this, like if they are selling a bunch of their assets, a well-capitalized miner may be one that, you know, use treasury management strategy and, and miners take notes, could sweep in and get distressed assets, right? And, and rack space is scarce. We've talked about this on, on a couple other pods, but, you know, it's pretty... I don't know. It's pretty exciting stuff. This is huge news. Like, I thank you for listing out all that rack space that they have. The hosting is obviously the largest part of their business, but you know, there's land, energy contracts, contracts with large firms that all need to be renegotiated during this chapter 11. So we will see what that looks like. Um, glad it's chapter 11. And yes, from the information I have, both Marathon Digital is going to continue operating. They already have about 30 megawatts, or is it, I think it's 40 megawatts rather. Uh, already online with Compute North, it's about three exahash, and they've booted up Mara Pool again, so you can track that actively to see how their deployment is being handled through Chapter Eleven. And then from Compass side, we expect business as usual as well. Uh, we'll see what that is like, um, but pretty big news for Compute North. They have a lot, lot of different customers out there, uh, so we don't really know what that's going to look like. Quickly, a couple more that they're hosting that I dug up. Bit Digital, Integrated Ventures, Mawson Group, Marathon definitely the sort of biggest fish that they're they're hosting for sure. But just wanted to get 
throw a couple more details out for you, Will. Yeah, we will definitely see what Chapter 11 looks like. And I think a lot of people are going to be figuring that out. There's definitely a lot of things in the court that we're going to have to see. For Marathon Digital, let's turn to them because I think that's probably the largest implications for the mining space. Uh, that being because Marathon Digital and Rye Blockchain are probably the most well-known mining equities. A lot of people have turned to mining equities over the last two years. People who wanted exposure to Bitcoin, but wanted it through a traditional portfolio and they chose to buy a uh, mining equity, that being Marathon Digital in, in many cases. Their market cap was $8 billion back in November during the peak of Bitcoin's price. We hit like almost $70,000 per coin. Since then, it's gone down uh, quite a bit. Like I think we're hovering around $700 million market cap. Today, Marathon Digital's stock is only down, oh wow, it just actually dropped. Like It's down like 8% now. Uh, earlier this morning is only down 1%. So markets are definitely reacting and baking this in. Marathon Digital also saw uh, a de degradation of its stock from BTIG's Gregory Lewis, uh, which is just a Wall Street firm looking at um, like if you should buy a stock or not. So we're already seeing that the markets are responding to this news because Compute North was the largest hosting provider for Marathon and Marathon's were stuck. Marathon's been moving away from some of the Compute North stuff. They've been uh, moving to a few different facilities. I think they signed something in North Dakota for about 250 megawatts. The company's name escapes me right now. But they've been trying to diversify their hosting operations because uh, Compute North has been slow or it's been difficult to get things set up in Texas. I know there's been a lot of things with ERCOT in the region as well. Uh, but this is definitely big for Marathon, which has over 30,000 units still waiting around to be plugged in if not more like they closed their heart in sight they have been waiting for marathon digital or for compute north to go live and they have more units uh coming in the door including s19 xps yeah and they've caught a lot of flack right like over time unfortunately it just seems like the road is not getting easier for marathon they've had a lot of machines on the sidelines not hashing uh where people kind of turning their head wondering what's going on there and it just seems like this is, you know, another thing to toss into the ring is that Compute North going down. They're going to have to figure out, you know, potentially down the line what to do uh, with those machines. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a lot of megawatts. Uh, if you add that all up, I think we approach a gigawatt. And I think some of their sites have capacity for, for even larger deployments, right? Especially the ones in West Texas, because there's just so much energy there. Uh, this is big news. We'll see what happens with it. Uh, Right now, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out what this means. Chapter 11 can take quite a while. Uh, from CompuNord side, I think it's a responsible move to make if this is with the decision. It was an election to go into Chapter 11, which I think is important. They didn't necessarily have to do this, but they have elected to do it in order to renegotiate, reset their contracts. And we even have some quotes that they sent out to the block saying that they are doing this in order to restructure their business so they can get back on their feet. And if I can just for a moment say like that makes sense within like the, the bear market right now, like how many companies have we talked about over the last few weeks, Matt, that just are struggling and they're refusing to accept reality. And it's tough because Bitcoin's so cyclical. You go up really high and then you come down so low. And when you're building up a high, a lot of the practices you, you choose to make don't make sense during a bear market and you have to restructure and that restructuring can be really painful. So I think they're being a little preemptive here and getting ahead of that. But of course, we will see what happens with all this. Any final thoughts? I, I wouldn't suspect that um, news of these type of things is going to stop, right? Uh, I think, you know, Compute North is kind of just joining the, if you look at the broader crypto space, the the Voyager, the BlockFi, the Three Arrows Club. Um, but as you said before, we've been talking about it, all the pain that miners have been feeling for a while. Not surprised the story comes out like this, but it is it is a major story, right? And feeling for them over there at Compute North um, and hope the best comes of this for everyone involved. Mining is tough. No one says it's easy. I think we all forget that during a, a bull market, but mining is very difficult. It goes all the way back to the white paper. It's supposed to be difficult. Uh, let's turn to some Ethereum stories, actually. One Ethereum story, rather. Uh, this is a, another bear market story. It's about Stakefish, which is a sister company of F2 Pool. F2 Pool, of course, is a very well-known Bitcoin mining pool. I think they're probably third largest Bitcoin mining pool. 
uh, at this time. Someone can probably correct me in the comments though. Uh, but they're pretty big and they've been around for quite a while. But Stakefish is their Ethereum validator. Uh, they booted this project up back in like 2019, 2020, with the purpose of offering a validation platform for anyone who wanted to stake their Ethereum going into ETH 2.0. Once the merge was completed, however, they decided to downsize their team. It was not handled in a very appropriate way, according to some alleged comments in a Coindesk article. Of course, it's hard to know because we only have one side of the story here so far. But according to comments from former and current employees of Stakefish, about 25% of the staff were let go on the day of the Ethereum merge, which of course the firm was building towards for the last few years. So it's a little painful that they decided to make that transition on basically like the finishing lap or like the finish line of the project they're at. Uh, there's some really interesting quotes in here. Uh, some people within the staking community, within the Ethereum community and some of these people, even former miners, uh, were let go or were put in tough spots and decided to resign. Uh, really interesting story because, again, Stakefish is place in the ecosystem and larger F2 pool as well. And then seeing like what are the repercussions for a bear market? Like you think someone might be safe. You think a pool like F2 pool or Stakefish might be safe, but then the bear market comes and you have to readjust strategies. Yeah, more layoffs in the bear market. Right. We've seen it I feel like Coinbase sort of kicked this off like earlier on. Um, it's just evidence of a troubled market. I think some of the sort of specific things to this story that's a bit interesting. Um, only non tech positions were laid off here is something that they um, put out and, and is in this Coindesk article here. So it seems like they're making sort of specific, intentional ways to lean up their company and have a tech focus. Um, but as you said before, these, this layoff seems very cutthroat. A lot of the employees, um, it doesn't seem to settle well with. Uh, one said that the layoffs implemented in a horrible way. Another said that there was sort of a team call um, where some of the people on the call didn't know that they were in fact fired. And then, of course, was left dumbstruck is the exact words there. So tough for, uh, for the employees of stake. Stakefish. Um, I know there's some high level employees also laid off over there. Hope the best for all of them. Um, and hope, hopefully they find a new home in the crypto space. Yeah, is this is definitely tough. And like, I don't think it was handled well, especially on the day of the merge, like you let people go and they've been building towards this for quite a while. So that's tough to see. These things do happen during a bear market and things are never necessarily handled well. And letting go of people is tough, right? Um, but you do definitely have to trim. And you brought up the Coinbase example, right? They were also criticized for letting people go. That was back in the spring. I think it was March or April. They let off about a fifth of their staff. It was about 1,000 employees or a little over 1,000 employees. And they decided to do that just by basically logging everybody out of their company laptops and then bringing everybody into a group call and saying, like, you were let go. Uh, and they were criticized for that as well. But it's difficult from an HR perspective. Like, how do you let all these people go? They have sensitive information, whatever it be, right? It's it's tough to make these calls. And I think that is one lasting legacy we might see coming out of this bull market and into a bear market is people might be a little slower to jump into crypto because of the legacy of these layoffs, right? So last time, 2017, 2018, there was definitely layoffs as well. But the industry was much smaller. I think this time around, the industry is much bigger. There's a lot of normies who jumped in and then were let go once the music stopped. And I think the next time we see a bull market, people might be a little slower to jump in. Uh, that's one prediction I'm having. Of course, people do have short memories, so we never know. But this is definitely a disappointing story to end the week on, but notable, so we needed to cover it. Yeah, to, to your point there, I just want to say there's a, there's a lot of like startup culture that's still embedded in the in the crypto space, right? So they could do these things and have sort of abrupt um, layoffs like you like you've just talked about. And I think like free markets is very much so something that crypto holds close to heart. Um, you know, there is nobody that's sort of at the top controlling uh, like the money supply and a lot of aspects of Bitcoin. I think that attracts a lot of people here, but we're seeing sort of the downside of that as well. Companies sort of taking that in. And when it's time to make layoffs, they've decided it's time to make layoffs and it's not um, massaged. It's not, you know, giving you a bunch of lead time. It's, it's, it's time to make the layoff. We're making these cuts. It's happening now. 
hope for the best. Yeah. No, we've definitely seen a lot of this conversation in tech circles as well, because tech is more or less prone to the same boom and bust cycles. It's been up only for the most part since 2010 with tech, but there's also like a lot of layoffs in startup culture and you come in and six months later you're out the door because the company realized that it oversold itself and hired too many people. And uh, crypto, that happens quite a bit. So I'm hoping that these stories end pretty soon here uh, because they're definitely like an indicator of like the depths of the bear market. And hopefully we're like getting past that stage, but might just be the beginning, especially this Compu North news, like that big capitulation. Uh, hopefully there's not many more. Okay, let's turn to the next conversation. When you talk about Bitmain discounting ASIC prices, which is big news, along with difficulty going up all-time high over 32 trillion in hash price all time low which like is like seven cents eight cents yeah i think seven and a half cents i mean sort of ties into the first story right um minor revenues down uh that being said never been as many hashes going to the bitcoin network right so i mean the, the question there i guess is why and it seems to me that you know, miners still have positive operating margins. So they're just going to keep going. If if they're not sort of wholly profitable, right? Maybe, um, you know, we've seen several debt restructurings. Maybe they um, can't service all of their interest payments and, you know, their de depreciation expenses on the books are hurting them, but they're still getting paid and, and have profitable operating margins. You know, it makes sense to keep going. Um, but yeah, I mean... The most chain protection that we've ever had, bullish generally for the I fundamentals love that. of Bitcoin, right? <laughs> no double <laughs> spends <laughs> happening here. <laughs> <laughs> this Bitmain discount is also huge news. So this is according to a CoinDesk article. Bitcoin mining rigs are down 70% during this bear market. But Bitmain, via a tweet sent on Tuesday earlier this week, said that Ant, Ant Miner S19 Pro 100 terahash models are being dropped to $19 per tear hash, which is about 30% below the index maintained by Luxor. So you know, that's a pretty steep discount on top of already a discounted secondary market. Uh, it's interesting to see them push. There's a nice money quote here at the end from Matt Schultz of CleanSpark estimating that there are between a quarter million and a half million new mining rigs sitting in boxes across the United States which is a huge amount of machinery. And it makes sense why Bitmain would discount even further in order to get the remaining machines off their shelves. So remember, Bitmain has allocations from foundries. Bitmain has these machines already. They can undercut anyone in the market at any point. And right now, I think that's what we're going to see, right? We're going to have these secondary markets, which are more liquid, which is a nice component of going to a bear market because people will buy, we'll, we'll have a price for, and people will be able to purchase things. But it's it's bad because Bitmain can also just flush out their inventory because they can because they've already made all their money off all their pr machines prior. Yeah, to, to me this is this is Bitmain waving their hands and saying, "Don't look to the secondary markets. Like I know you can get an S19 over there, but you could come get an S19 over here too, and you can get it for cheaper." Um, I mean, last year around the same time, machines were at. 70 80 dollars per tera hash now they're coming in bitman saying their cell phone 19 dollars per tera hash huge cuts right and i mean if uh if a miner is out there thinking you know they may want to take advantage of a bankruptcy proceeding i know celsius had a lot of uh mining operations as well more machines than i had figured until the the filings actually came out they can decide do they want to try to go through and um get those distressed assets right through the through the bankruptcy sort of auction system or just go buy from bitmain and get it even cheaper so we're like in an m a deal if, if someone raised a bunch of debt to buy a bunch of machines at 80 dollars per terahash do you want to scoop them up and are you valuing their assets very high or do you just want to buy from bitmain it's tough there's a lot of machines out there and this is a this is a cyclical part of Bitcoin mining, right? Is the fact that there's a manufacturing arm and it's centralized it means that they can pump out a bunch of these machines and start selling them when things are really high. And then when the market goes down, they can continue to pump out these machines and just clean out the floor price where everyone's sort of stuck with things. And at the same time, we have this rack space problem where you can't get a machine on a rack in time because there's just no room. 
And so you see ASIC prices drop even further. So this is definitely going to hurt secondary markets or anyone who sells ASICs. They're going to see a drop in profits for machines. Uh, and then I think it's also has implications for the security of Bitcoin itself. I don't think big repercussions at all, uh, but a quarter million to a half million machines is a lot. And a lot of those machines are going to be next generation machines. So uh, where and when those plug in and how they get plugged in, it's interesting. And this has been a conversation back in the past when it was basically only Bitmain pumping out ASICs. Like what if Bitmain pumped out too many to the wrong party and that party wanted to do something to Bitcoin? I think at this point we're past that. Like there's millions of Bitcoin mining machines out there. Uh, but this is definitely something that I'm curious to watch happen because a bunch of cheap machines flooding the market definitely changes uh, economics for Bitcoin ASICs. Yeah, I mean, just on the historic story of Bitmain and sort of Bitcoin or concerns, right? There was the whole ASIC boost, right? Uh, ASIC covert boost, right? Drama and with Jihan Wu and, you know, Bitmain was also running a lot of mining pools. Um, thankfully, Bitcoin made it through all of that, right? And it seemed like it was uh, more of a badge of strength that it sort of um, made it through potential risks at the time. But I think I've had I have seen what you sort of alluded to, Will, of a critique of different Bitcoiners talk about um, Ethereum when they were proof of work, saying that there's a lot of sideline GPUs in the world that could potentially um, come in and try to pose a 51% attack. And you know, the more and more there are sideline ASICs, you know, that I guess that risk could sort of surface in some people's eyes. I don't really see it as a security risk, truthfully, I think it'd be very, very difficult to pull off. And it would, it would at least be very, very obvious to see it if you're watching um, sort of the chain or, or even, you know, you could look at energy footprints from satellites. There's, there's a lot of people that are paying attention to Bitcoin now to where I think it's very difficult to sort of penetrate its security. That being said, it's something to observe, right? And like you said, the manufacturing base is quite centralized to Bitmain, um, what's minor, right? Canon is sort of a very small fraction at this point these days, as far as I understand. We could do a whole podcast on if it's Canon or Canon or Canon. <laughs> Let's talk about hash price. Close out the show here. Okay. Hash price is down to all time lows, uh, which of course hash price is for the audience, uh, more or less a metric to understand revenue per hash generated by an ASIC. And this metric has been going south for quite a while and it's pretty brutal at the same time we see energy costs also rising right so we have two things fighting against each other it's getting pretty tight for a lot of miners out there and i think for a lot of older generation miners like 2020 or previous and 20s or previous could be turning those machines off for a little bit until difficulty goes back down or bitcoin's price gets better yeah a lot of headwinds a lot of headwinds, right? Uh, hash price lower now than it was right after the halving in May 2020. Um, you know, it's the the mining space is just going to get more and more concentrated in the hands of the people with the lowest electricity cost, right? The highest efficiency machines, um, and you know, at this point, I guess also like lowest interest payments, right? And um, the ones that have depreciated their machines the most and sort of it goes on and on, but it's definitely getting stricter and tighter and the lending space is getting more and more difficult um, with access to capital. And so, it, you know, conditions are tough for miners out there. And uh, that's why I think, you know, the, this Compute North news is, is not necessarily a surprise, right? And we could potentially see more. I think we have to prepare for that. Definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of things that intertwine here. So Compute North... They do not mind my knowledge at all. They're just doing infrastructure, but it's put right. a lot of people who wanted to have miners online in a tough spot. So they're going to have to wait. That being said, it's not the worst time to not be mining because mining profitability is pretty low right now. And sometimes you want to wait until profitability goes back up to plug in. But we also don't know what the future holds. Like Bitcoin could stay pretty low for a while based on macro headwinds that we've been seeing with the fed increasing interest rates so there's a lot of things that tie into each other here but it's uh it's kind of bad stuff all around pretty gloomy news this week compute north i know too cool or uh steak fish i should say and then hash price if you uh waited on the sideline with a bunch of cash you can probably buy some asics for pretty cheap so maybe that's the only silver lining here 
Yeah. All miners, are you still mining? Are you still hashing? Mm. So that Comment one. Below. Let us know if you're still mining or send us send us some photos of your mining operation. Matt, any closing words of wisdom for the crowd? Enjoy the weekend. I love it. I'm going to be trying to learn um, Apache Airflow in Python. If you know it, let me know. It's going to be Ooh. fun. I don't even know what that means, but that sounds fun. I'm going to enjoy New York. Okay, we'll see you next week.